Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm going to present the second lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the integumentary system. And in this lecture and the next lecture, we're going to talk about viruses that attack the skin, usually as part of their systemic attack on the body. The first lecture is going to cover those viruses whose lesion is primarily necrosis. This will cover the herpes viruses and also many of the viruses that cause vesicular disease, among others. The second part of this lecture is going to cover those viruses that cause proliferation of the skin, including the pox viruses, the papillomaviruses, and other viruses like retroviruses, which actually can cause tumor formation. So with that, let's begin. And as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. And as we go through these lectures, this list is going to get longer and longer. And let's start with this angry looking cat right here. This picture is a great one to kick off our discussion about herpes viruses and the skin. There are three main types of herpes viruses. The alpha herpes virus, who do classic necrotizing lesions. But the other two groups also can cause necrosis. The beta herpes viruses, which are cytomegaloviruses, luckily we don't have to worry about them in the skin. And then the gamma herpes viruses. And the gamma herpes viruses, as we'll see in these two lectures, can cause both necrotizing lesions as well as proliferative lesions as well in various animal species. Feline herpes virus causes a number of conditions in cats. It's best known as being one of the major contributors to feline upper respiratory infections, causing a disease known as feline viral rhinotracheitis. This herpes virus, like many herpes viruses, will infect the animal and then, after initial diseases pass, will become latent in the neural ganglia of the face especially the trigeminal ganglia, and then will recrudesce as the animal is stressed or immunosuppressed. This is a great case of facial herpes dermatitis. Some animals may also get lesions in the eye as well. So when this virus comes back out of the nerves, it infects the skin of the face, and you get classic necrosis, ulceration of the skin. And if you biopsy it at the edge, you may be lucky enough to be able to see a cell with an enlarged nucleus with a herpes viral intranuclear inclusion, or even better yet, syncytial cells, which may or may not contain herpes viral inclusions. These are classic lesions for all of the alpha herpes viruses that we're going to look at. And the key is the biopsy needs to be taken at the very edge of this lesion because if we biopsy the middle, all of that epithelium which is infected is going to be gone and you're not going to get very much. One of the interesting things about the lesion in the cat is that the response that the cat produces has a large number of eosinophils. This gives you a couple of other rule outs like various syndromes in the eosinophilic granuloma complex and mosquito bite hypersensitivity, all of which will give you a lot of EOs. It's not intuitive, but once you see EOs on the skin biopsy of the cat from the face, I want you to think about feline herpes virus. Little kitty cats will get it, and even big cats will get it. It's a classic disease of cheetahs. Cheetahs are largely immunosuppressed because of the tremendous inbreeding that's going on, and they can get significant disease related to herpes viral infection and recrudescence in the face and the eyes. When we think about alpha herpes viruses in animal species, one of the classic presentations that's seen across the board, even in humans, are alpha herpes viruses, which in the natural host don't generally cause too much of a problem. But during times of stress or immunosuppression, 
will recrudesce to form largely mouth ulcers or ulcers on the genitals in the vulva or on the penis. They may spread to the skin surrounding these areas. We are looking at the vulva of a horse with herpes viral infections. This is equine herpes virus type 3, which causes a disease known as equine coital exanthema, and affected animals will have uh, ulcerated areas within the vulva, the vagina, and as we can see here, we have these crateriform lesions on the skin around the vulva itself. The stallion would have corresponding ulcers on the uh, uh, shaft of the penis as well. Similar lesions could be seen in cattle by the same herpes virus, bovine herpes virus type 1, which causes infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. It's been known to cause lesions of the genitals. As a matter of fact, before the 1950s, that was the only form, infectious balanopostitis or infectious uh, pustular vulvovaginitis, diseases which are still here today, were the only form, even before the respiratory form from which that disease gets its name, are found. When we think about humans, we think about herpes simplex 1, which gives ulcers on the lips and within the mouth, and herpes simplex number 2, which causes genital lesions. So when you think about many of these herpes viruses in the natural host, oral and genital lesions are the rule. This is certainly the rule in alpha herpes viruses in macaques, but I want to give you another rule in just a minute, which is even more important. We can see that this macaque has extensive ulceration on its tongue, ulcers within the mouth and the gingiva. You can also see that they have spread to the lips and the haired skin around the mouth. So you can get ulceration from macazine herpes virus type 1 of the skin with no problem. Um, in the Immunosuppressed animal, the very young, the very old, and especially those who are infected concurrently with immunosuppressive viruses like simian lentivirus or, or type E retrovirus, which causes SIV, or the SAIDS virus, simian retrovirus type 2, the infection by the alpha herpes virus, maxine herpes virus type 1, becomes much more severe. You can see it affected the conjunctiva and the skin of the face as well. Now, before we leave this particular disease, which is known over the years as herpes B, the other thing that is a very important, I include in all my lectures when I talk about herpes B, is that many of these alpha herpes viruses can jump species. And when they jump species, it is with devastating effect. Herpes B or herpes, uh, Maxine herpes virus type 1 is generally restricted to the natural hosts, which are Asian macaques. It's never been seen in African uh, monkeys. But when that virus jumps to a human host, either by scratch, by saliva splash, or by a bite, it can be absolutely devastating. And untreated results in a necrotizing and lymphoplasmacytic encephalitis, which results in death in 70% of cases. This is a real severe problem. We treat every macaque um, during treatment and at autopsy as is, as if it is infected, because alpha herpes viruses, you know, are latent infections, and they often will recrudesce and not show a lot of signs. So you have to treat every macaque as is. is if it is affected with herpes B, and we need to maintain vigilance to monitor these animals. So if they show any signs of this potentially deadly disease to humans, then we can remove them from the colony. Uh, Maxine herpes virus type 1 is certainly not the only uh, herpes virus that can jump species and cause severe disease. Uh, herpes simplex 1, the virus that causes uh, oral ulceration or fever blisters in people can be transmitted to pet rabbits and has been known to cause, once again, 
a severe and fatal meningoencephalitis because somebody with a, a fever blister is kissing their rabbit and transmits the virus. Uh, herpes simplex 1 has also uh, been well documented in causing severe disease in uh, New World primates. Uh, this is a Aotis monkey and there are two possibilities for this. It might have received uh, uh, herpes cimeris type 1. The old name is herpes tamarinus because it was first identified in tamarind monkeys. Squirrel monkeys are a natural host for this. They don't get any disease. When they come in contact with other New World monkeys, you can have a life-threatening, very severe disease resulting in uh, face, severe facial dermatitis, tremendous ulceration of the mouth and tongue, and necrosis in multiple organs. The other possibility, and you basically have to do PCR to sort these out, is that this particular infection came from a human, one of those with herpes simplex 1. The lesions of herpes simplex 1 and herpes samiri type 1 are exactly the same, and you normally have to do PCR to sort them out rapidly progressing disease, including ulceration of the upper GI tract and the conjunctiva and the face, multiple uh, multisystemic necrosis, and death within a number of days. Another herpes virus in macaques which causes problems are the varicella viruses, another genus of type 1 or alpha herpes viruses. Uh, somewhat unrelated to the ones that we looked at before, but this is one whose prototype is chickenpox in people. And both humans and uh, macaques have their own varicella viruses. Actually, a number of species have their own varicella viruses. In uh, affected macaques, the lesions of human chickenpox, which is transmissible, or simian varicella virus type 9, um, are almost identical. Usually causes a vesicular blistering rash, which can become rather severe, starts around the face. It's very pyritic, and if you've ever had chickenpox, you know you just want to scratch and scratch, and you can get these extremely pyritic rashes. I'm not good at rashes in primates, but the ones that are caused by varicella virus because of the tremendous pruritus are generally much worse looking. Remember that uh, varicella virus in people causes shingles, and these rashes in the animals with varicella always look like shingles to me, very angry, very pruritic, usually very traumatized. Now, we also have a situation that very difficult to, to differentiate between human varicella virus, which is transmissible to macaques, and simian varicella virus. So another case which the lesions will be very similar, you're probably going to need PCR to sort these out. So, you know, these alpha herpes viruses, which jump species and cause severe diseases back and forth between primates and non-human primates, are a great reason why we monitor our workers so rigorously for disease. So many of the diseases of non-human primates are diseases of captivity and the, historically they have come from the human handler. So chickenpox or simian varicella virus is uh, the same. Here's another case of chimpanzee varicella virus another species that has their own varicella viruses. I have lost count of all of the herpes viruses that you ha can find in non-human primates. There are so many, but these are very classic lesions that look just like chickenpox in people. Chimps are susceptible to human chickenpox as well. So um, every species has many different herpes viruses. Okay. There's not a species out there that doesn't have them. Um, they often cause necrotizing lesions in the skin and multiple organs. So think about that. I want to switch to another type of herpes viruses. We talked about the alpha herpes viruses, which cause necrosis, um, multinucleated cells, and syncytia. We talked about cytomegalovirus, the beta herpes viruses, which really don't cause anything. And there's a third large group of uh, herpes viruses, the gamma herpes viruses. Uh, these gamma herpes viruses have largely been uh, subclassified into renino viruses 
and lymphocryptoviruses nowadays. And most of the gamma herpes viruses are well known for causing proliferative lesions, for establishing latency in lymphocytes and causing proliferative lesions, which often resemble uh, lymphoid neoplasms. And we're going to talk about some in the next lecture where we talk about the viruses that cause proliferation. But here's one that doesn't really fit the mold very well. This is a gamma herpes virus. There are a number of them that uh, cause a disease primarily in ruminants. The name of the disease is malignant catarrhal fever. There are a number of different syndromes. And basically, this gamma herpes virus causes a pan-systemic lymphoproliferative disease of ruminants and artiodactyls. The most common in North America is ovine herpes virus type 2, um, which in which sheep or the natural host can rarely be infected. The natural host of these herpes viruses rarely develop disease. If sheep are inoculated with a tremendous inoculum, they can develop a systemic vasculitis, and that is how most of these uh, viruses manifest as a systemic lymphoproliferative vasculitis of multiple organs in a non-natural host. So sheep will give it to cattle, they will give it to bison who are tremendously susceptible or other ruminants but rarely show the signs. There are a number of other ruminants that have these. Uh, wildebeest have been known for many years. You can also, um, there is one in goats, there is one in white-tailed deer. Um, and more as we go along. I think there's a new one in Sika deer. Um, the lesion is the result largely of the vasculitis. Um, the skin lesions that we see with malignant cantaral fever really aren't that bad. You see the worst lesions in the GI tract. You can see lesions in the brain. And, and all these places are a lot more critical. When we see the skin lesions of malignant cantaral uh, malignant catarrhal fever. It's usually associated with the oronasal form. You can see that there is uh, mucus running out of this animal's nose. But the cutaneous lesion that you may see in this animal is ulcerations and erosions on the nose. It gets very dry, and that is because the small vessels of the nasal pad will be thrombosed. That's what usually happens with this particular condition. You get vasculitis and thrombosis and the tissue which these vessels serve becomes ischemic and necrotic. You can also see uh, uh, ulcers in areas of friction on these animals between the toes in the inguinal region or whatever. Areas of friction always seem to be more susceptible in ruminants with viral skin disease. And we're going to look at a number of more of them in this lecture. So malignant catarrhal fever, not something that I especially think of in terms of cutaneous lesions, but you will see them. It is part of the attack and it's due to the underlying vasculitis. A little confusing because it's a herpes virus um, and it has a very different uh, method of attack. Let's look at a couple more herpes virus lesions, which are sort of interesting. And uh, this is a young piglet, usually two weeks less of age, and this is the group that is most susceptible to multisystemic infection by another alpha herpes virus, uh, porcine herpes virus type 1, also referred to as sewed herpes virus type 1. Usually the nomenclature for most of these herpes viruses, but not all, is if you see something herpes virus type 1, it is the most important herpes viral syndrome, the classic syndrome, usually an alpha herpes virus in which necrosis is the main feature. Now, with uh, pseudo herpes type 1, this is the other name for pseudo rabies, uh, a herpes viral which in itself, in the younger animals, will cause uh, by itself ballooning degeneration and necrosis of epithelial cells with those classic intranuclear inclusions within the stratum spinosum. 
young piglets, especially those two born to naive infected sows, because this virus can cross the placenta, are the ones that are, are severely affected. In addition to the classic skin lesions and blisters that you see, you'll also see neurologic signs. These animals will be down and paddling. And as early as three weeks, the disease um, severity starts to decrease in affected animals, goes a little bit more to respiratory signs, but the young animals, it can be fairly devastating. Now remember, like other herpes viruses, they tend to get into the nerves. And in other species, besides pigs, you don't get this high mortality. Here is an ox, we're looking at the prepuce and the ventral abdomen. And animals that are infected with pseudorabies because of the tremendous irritation that it causes within the nerves that it goes into latency in, will get the classic mad itch, tremendous pruritus. It's like having shingles, the irritation of the nerves and the animals will scratch and rub and they will rub their skin actually raw. Uh, actual deaths due to pseudorabies in uh, adult animals are not that common, but the lesions associated with them, then the animals will be euthanized to prevent spread within uh, a herd or group. So classic case of pseudorabies in an ox. Okay, as so we finish up the uh, a subset of the herpes viruses. There are a couple of other interesting uh, diseases or outbreaks that have been published within the last decade or so. Uh, this was uh, a rabbit, and it's the head of a rabbit. It's very swollen. He's not just squeezing the head too hard, but the head itself is very swol swollen as a result of edema. And this is a herpes virus, a novel herpes virus that's been seen in rabbits in the Northwest US and Canada a number of times. Uh, and it causes uh, a number of signs in the uh, skin. It causes a hemorrhagic dermatitis and paniculitis, which is associated with the formation of small vesicles and necrosis of the hair follicles. And, and you can see syncytia and inclusions within the hair follicles. Um, that's the cutaneous manifestation. Uh, these animals may die as a result of necrosis in other organs, including the, uh, the lung, the heart and in the red pulp of the spleen. So it's a systemic infection. One of the classic lesions are the, uh, uh, the herpes viruses within the skin and the tremendous swelling that is seen along with it. And to wind up herpes virus, here is a picture from an article in Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic uh, uh, Investigation from 2011. And this was an animal who was found dead. This is a fisher, which is a mustelid, and these mustelids are uh, near and dear to my own heart. Um, and the lesions were multiple ulcers on the muzzle and the plantar pad. So it's an ulcer of dermatitis and fissures. Uh, I don't know how widespread this is, but an interesting manifestation of an alpha herpes viral disease. Okay, so let's start on another group of viruses. They are diverse viruses, which all cause very similar lesions in a number of animal species. We're looking at the snout of a pig with a large blister. Now we're looking at a snout of a pig with a large broken blister. Let's go back to the one that looks a little nicer. And when we think about vesicular diseases, we think about the pig. The pig gets all of them. So let's talk about some basic concepts of the vesicular disease. First concept, vesicular diseases don't kill any animals. They get blisters. They get blisters on their skin. They get blisters in their mouth, which makes it difficult for eat and to makes, makes them drool. They get blisters on their teats. So if they're milking cattle or they're nursing, 
young animals, they won't want to do that. They get blisters on the coronary bands of their feet so they don't want to walk. These are not by themselves life-threatening diseases. What they are are extremely contagious diseases which knock down production tremendously. Animals don't produce milk. They don't put on weight. It can be devastating to the meat and dairy industry or the pork industry when you have outbreaks of disease. But they don't kill animals on their own. People kill the animals to stop the spread of the disease. It can be tremendous economic hardship. The second important concept is the one that we care about is foot and mouth disease. Pigs get four other diseases that we really don't care that, not that much about after we find out that it's not foot and mouth disease. Sure, we'll, we'll wipe them out and all that, but every blister we have to treat as this could be the first case of foot and mouth disease, and that's why these diseases, even though they don't kill animals, have become so incredibly important. So, take a quick look at foot and mouth disease. Uh, it is caused by an aptovirus, which infects ruminants and swine, the so-called cloven hoof species. We get uh, uh, blisters on the face and the mouth, as we said before, affected animals will, will, uh, uh, will smack their lips and their drool. In pigs, we can have uh, blisters which underrun the claws and you can result in uh, necrosis of the coronary band and loss of the claw. Of course, this animal is going to be lost. Pigs are known as the amplifying species because in foot and mouth disease they can produce tremendous amount of antigen and a virus and the virus can be spread in so many ways and it can even be airborne so you get outbreaks between farms that are miles away it can be spread by any sorts of of veterinarians or cars or whatever so it spreads extremely quickly between animals and between farms the only way to truly contain it is to eradicate it, eradicate all the animals on a farm. Now, it's not difficult to identify infected pigs or infected cattle. Horses don't get this disease. One of the big problems that faces uh, veterinarians in the face of a, a foot and mouth disease outbreak is that small ruminants, sheep and goats, show minimal signs or not clinically affected like pigs and cattle. And so what you get are these very small ulcers or very small uh, blisters in the mouth and the coronary band, which uh, may show uh, minimal, minimal impairment or no impairment to the animal because it's very difficult to make a clinical diagnosis. And it's thought that in the major outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the UK back in 2001, um, sheep were a and goats were a major part of the outbreak. Um, they're very susceptible to viral infections. They, they may show no or minimal lesions. And it's not unusual for people to get their goats or sheep and put them in their trucks and drive them all over the place in the midst of a foot and mouth disease outbreak. And that was one of the issues, the inability to control sheep and goats, which contributed to the longevity of that particular economically devastating outbreak in the United Kingdom. Foot and mouth disease can also be spread to wildlife as well. Um, it has been seen in a number of wild artiodactyls in the United States including uh, pronghorn, as we see here, um, the claw is coming off. Um, mule deer and bison have also been infected in natural outbreaks. Usually the only thing that you can see in these is an increased uh, amount of predation. Obviously, if you can't run away, you're going to uh, uh, have trouble. 
Here's a large ulcer on the tongue of a pronghorn antelope, and that reminds me to say that one of the characteristics of foot and mouth disease, at least in the oral cavity that we don't see with the other vesicular diseases, um, is the large ulcers, almost degloving injuries, when uh, uh, the aptivirus that causes foot and mouth disease attacks the epithelium. You have large areas of the mucosa which slough off, as opposed to um, smaller ulcers in the other diseases. So let's go back and just cover the other diseases. Here's our, our prototypical pig blister. And the next one that we probably should talk about is one that affects all animal species, and that is vesicular stomatitis. Let me correct myself, it doesn't affect all animal species. Um, it affects the animal species that we're concerned about with these vesicular diseases. So that are, those are pigs, cattle, and horses. And all of those can be infected by the rhabdovirus that causes vesicular stomatitis. Vesicular stomatitis is the only vesicular disease that affects horses. And it's clinically indistinguishable in other species from foot and mouth disease as we saw before. This rhabdovirus can't uh, break through the skin. It can infect intact mucosa, so it's usually spread by uh, biting flies. Uh, in these animal species, it's generally considered to be a self-limiting disease. The disease lasts one to five weeks. The ulcers will uh, become erosions and ultimately heal. It's usually seen in adult animals. For some reason, younger animals aren't, uh, aren't affected often. It is sporadically seen in certain pockets within North America, and it is uh, endemic in Central and South America. Uh, where camelids can get it in South America, uh, the disease does not occur in sheep and goats. With the names vesicular stomatitis, you can also imagine that these animals will have uh, blisters and then ulcers within the mouth. The horses will grind their teeth and salivate, but it is a self-limiting but reportable disease. So let's go back to our blistered pig here and talk about another largely historic disease uh, which has been eradicated since the uh, 1960s in pigs in the U.S., and that is vesicular exanthema. This is a Khaleesi viral dermatitis, uh, the Khaleesi virus of the genera Vesivirus. And the interest in vesicular exanthema of pigs, besides historical interest, is that it was probably spread from pig to pig um, by infection. But <clears throat> poor control of the pig cadavers allowed some of these pigs to go out into the garbage in the ocean, in which, and then the disease turned up in California sea lions uh, in areas generally on the flippers and areas of broken skin. The Khaleesi virus has been determined to be identical to the Khaleesi virus uh, that causes vesicular exanthema of swine. This uh, identification was made in 1972 um, when a disease on the rookery of San Miguel Island was identified as San Miguel sea lion virus, and you will occasionally still hear this Khaleesi virus referred to as San Miguel sea lion virus. Uh, rookeries and overcrowded areas where sea lions congregate uh, still provide an ideal environment for direct contact um, and spread of this virus, the same way that it was spread in pigs. Like most of the vesicular viruses, the necrosis uh, following viral infection occurs in the stratum spinosum. You initially see edema, then necrosis, and then coalescing areas of necrosis form these blisters. And like the pigs, you can also see oral cavity lesions in affected sea lions. Okay, we have two more diseases of pigs that we need to talk about, um, none of which are all that important. 
except for the fact that they can mimic foot and mouth disease. Uh, swine vesicular disease is caused by an enterovirus, and there is a recent uh, ad addition to this group, used to be four until a couple of years ago, now a fifth virus, Seneca uh, virus A, um, has been added to this list and once again causes blisters on the, uh, uh, on the lips, snout, tongue, and feet. And one of the reasons that you see so many blisters on the nose of, of pigs is it's an area of friction. They're always rooting around or something like this. So trauma to an area, as we see over and over again, um, tends to uh, worsen the damage. And so in a lot of these viruses which cause necrosis of the skin, the classic places are areas of friction on the body. If we look at another virus that can cause skin lesions, especially on the coronary band, and this time we're back to sheep. Remember, sheep didn't get a lot of the, the vesicular diseases that we talked about but a virus that will cause necrosis of the coronary band. And, and you can always tell when an animal has trouble with its feet because they get this base narrow stance, especially ruminants. Um, if we look, there is sort of uh, incipient hemorrhage and necrosis uh, in the coronary band of this particular animal. And then you can see here a more extensive necrosis and hemorrhage. This is an orbivirus, which is known as blue tongue. Blue tongue causes a lot of problems in affected sheep. It gets its name from the uh, uh, lesions that it causes in the mouth. Blue tongue, like all the other orbiviruses, is an endotheliotropic virus, which means it attacks endothelial cells. It infects causes necrosis of endothelial cells, and when you lose the endothelial cells, you expose the underlying collagen to fibrin, and you get thrombosis. So the lesions that we see associated with blue tongue in the coronary band and throughout the GI tract of uh, sheep are those of thrombosis and necrosis of the overlying epithelium. You'll see ulceration of the dental pad, you see swelling and cyanosis of the tongue due to thrombosis of the vessels, giving it its name blue tongue. This ulceration goes down through the GI tract. A blue tongue is also contagious for cattle as well. It doesn't cause a severe lesion. Uh, usually you get oral ulceration, salivation, but um, one of the problems, another problem we see with blue tongue beyond the GI and skin problems um, is that animals that are infected in utero, that virus has a predilection for affecting the developing brain and certain serotypes, especially in cattle, will cause tremendous uh, fatal defects in brain formation, including hydranencephaly or poor encephaly, large cavitary lesions. But this is a pretty classic lesion of blue tongue, hemorrhage and necrosis at the coronary band. And this can get bad enough that they can, these claws will actually come off. Another virus that affects almost every uh, system in the body is bovine pestivirus, the causative agent of bovine viral diarrhea and in animals that have been exposed in utero uh, and accepted the virus in itself, mucosal disease. And you can see lesions in almost every organ system. All of my lectures on the organ systems that I put out, perhaps with the exception of the reproductive system, have something having to do with bovine pestivirus. When we talk about bovine pestivirus, uh, animals with mucosal disease, we tend to think about all of the GI tract lesions. Um, but you can see lesions in the skin as well. <clears throat> the pestivirus that causes uh, mucosal disease will affect the basal epithelium and result in necrosis of the basal epithelium. So when you lose that basal epithelium, everything above it is going to slough off. And this is another disease in which the lesions are primarily seen in areas of 
friction. You keep rubbing something, um, and if the basal layer is not well attached, it's going to come off. One of the classic spots um, is between the toes, the interdigital area. We saw this earlier um, when we looked at malignant catarrhal fever, but it's an area of ulceration very commonly in pestiviruses. Uh, when you affect the basal layer of the coronary band, you can lose the hooves. This is one of the buttons as well. So these animals with mucosal disease will often be lame because their feet hurt due to the damage in the coronary band. But you can see ulceration in any area with friction. And here is the perineum. And that is often, you know, sort of rubbing against each other as the animal walks so you are going to see ulceration there so anywhere where you have friction or the body rubbing against each other an animal with mucosal disease you are going to have erosion and ulceration and it's just another of the myriad of ways that bovine pestivirus attacks affected cattle I think I'm going to talk about the other pestiviruses while we're on here. They're all a little bit different, but the three very important ones are the ones that affect cattle, uh, the ones that affect small ruminants, sheep, and the one that affects pigs. So let's look at a sheep real quick. And, and the uh, there are a number of things going on with this little newborn or recently born now, a lamb. We can see a, a umbilical cord here. And the thing that you see... Uh, very obviously is that the wool is very fine it doesn't curl up it's almost like hair or fur of another species and this is due to hypertrichosis uh, and infection in utero with the ovine pestivirus which causes border disease uh, beyond this uh, these animals, pestiviruses, are well known for the neurologic defects, their predilection to affect the developing brain, especially the cerebellum, which is the last uh, to develop. And so uh, we often will see cerebellar hypoplasia in ruminants with, uh, they're infected with pestiviruses. Uh, in this little lamb, he has a poorly formed cerebellum. He has shakes and intention tremors. And these animals with their poor hair coat and their uh, cerebellar difficulties are known as Harry Shaker lambs. Uh, one other thing that you will see is uh, uh, in porcine pestivirus, the causative agent in uh, uh, classical swine fever, which I learned as hog cholera, uh, is hemorrhage. Um, hog cholera, uh, generally, the pestivirus generally affects monocytes and macrophages. It causes um, a tremendous uh, cytokine problem in the body, but another uh, organ that it will go after is that vascular endothelium. So between that, the uh, uh, macrophage releasing all sorts of cytokines, causing a dysmegakaryocyte poesis and a thrombocytopenia. Animals with, uh, with classical swine fever often have extensive hemorrhages. Here we see hemorrhages. We actually even see ulceration, probably due to thrombosis of the underlying vessels. And because the animals are diminished, uh, greatly diminished in their platelet production, we can see some very extensive uh, hemorrhage. This virus, unlike other pestiviruses, really doesn't care much about uh, about the skin at all. It really is busy with causing hemorrhages throughout the body, body and infarction of the spleen um, and uh, clotting disorder. So classical swine fever will cause skin lesions as well. Okay, now I just want to end this particular lecture, about 45 minutes, with a disease that uh, uh, has really, we've really only known about within the last 15 years or so. This picture is from Dr. Patty Pesavento, who has done marvelous work uh, in this particular area. And what we're looking at is an area of severe edema, um, detachment, necrosis, and sloughing, or initial sloughing of skin 
in a cat with a new strain of Khaleesi virus, a virulent systemic strain. Khaleesi virus has been around for a long time. Uh, it's well known in shelters. It is a contributor to upper respiratory and uh, infections and oral ulceration in cats and occasionally pneumonia, but rarely goes beyond that. And when you have Khaleesi virus in, in a shelter, and most shelters do, you can have up to 100% of animals that are infected. But a, a novel strain of a feline Khaleesi virus was identified a number of years ago in which the mortality um, jumped to 40 to 60 percent of affected animals. And uh, the signs beyond the uh, uh, respiratory signs that were, were pretty classic of this included uh, uh, the severe edema and ulceration of the face and the feet and also adults were more likely to be stricken with this than kittens. Many of the affected cats had already been uh, uh, vaccinated against feline Khaleesi virus to make it worse. And it's not just the, uh, this is a, a systemic disease. It's not just the, the signs in the, uh, uh, the skin, the respiratory diseases uh, was much more severe and it also um, would hit the pancreas. The target of this virulent Khaleesi virus um, is the endothelial cells, which sort of explains the edema and the sloughing of the skin. And so this is virulent systemic feline Khaleesi virus, a virus that has popped up in a number of shelters, and it, it, there's no premonitory signs. It appears to be a mutation within a shelter and then this particular virus becomes predominant in causing uh, tremendous mortality in older cats as composed to the Khaleesi virus that we all grew up with. So virulent systemic feline Khaleesi virus. Thank you Patty Pesavento for this image and for your tremendous work on this particular condition. Okay, well that brings us to the end of part one of this series on viral diseases of the skin. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about viruses that cause proliferative lesions, lumps and bumps and tumors, a different way that the various viruses will infect the skin. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, um, and I look forward to bringing you that next lecture very soon, and I hope you'll come back to the Foundation's Facebook page or our YouTube channel or the Joint Pathology Center's uh, video library where you can get um, more of these lectures on uh, systems or uh, a number of uh, species of animals. So thank you for your time. I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope you enjoy wonderful health while doing it. Take care now.